In my opinion, Chamber of Secrets was a major improvement over Sorcerer's Stone, or Philosopher's Stone, as both a book and movie, and because of that, it's my personal favorite of the Harry Potter series. Although despite that, Sorcerer's Stone was still a pretty good start for the books and movies, but the PC game was lame. So the question is, did the video games improve as well? Let's find out in this review of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. When the game starts, you get an intro cutscene which uses the in-game graphics, which immediately tells us that EA didn't even really try with the graphics, obviously, as the game is still running off of the same engine the first game used and is using many of the same textures and models. They did get the character model's lip movement this time, but I can't really give them that much credit for that as it doesn't look that good. As for the rest of the presentation, well, the writing is okay, but the voice acting still hasn't improved much. Oh no! What are we going to do? The music, still composed by Jeremy Soule, has seen a gigantic leap in quality due to the fact that all of these tracks are played by an actual orchestra, as opposed to the first game which had mostly synthesized tracks. I mean, the soundtrack's wiki page also says that, like, three tracks in the first game were performed by an orchestra, but whatever. I don't feel like looking into it any further because I'm lazy. So the first level of the game is the Wumping Willow, where you have to get it to stop hugging Ron. No, seriously. Ron says that he's trapped, but he could obviously get out if he actually tried. But, all jokes aside, this tutorial is set up way better than the first game's tutorial, as it uses an existing part of the story instead of making a poorly explained reason why Harry has to do it. Although, I do have to question both Ron and Hermione's ability to teleport everywhere. Hmm. And instead of having it be like the book where Ron and Harry get detention, they instead get the worst punishment of all. Being nagged by Hermione. The horror! And Hermione being an annoying nag is a continuing trend in this game, so get used to her voice, you'll be hearing it a lot. Once you get to go inside Hogwarts, you'll notice it's been redesigned. The reason for that is because the game gives you a lot of freedom to roam around instead of constantly keeping you on a set path. There are more secret areas, classrooms, and collectibles. And speaking of collectibles, the game gives you an incentive to collect stuff now. The famous witches and wizard cards have gotten a big update. There are now three different types of cards, bronze, silver, and gold. Collecting 10 bronze cards gives you a new health bar, and 10 silver cards gives you a key to unlock a special challenge to collect the special edition gold cards, which have an entire room devoted to them. Even though the gold cards are almost entirely pointless, it's still pretty fun. The birdie bots every flavored beans can now be traded with other students for wizard cards, quidditch upgrades, and potion ingredients. By the way, this chick, right here, in the grand staircase, came prepared. She has so many flubberworm mucuses, I'ma leave a good review on Yelp. Yes, now you can brew your own Wiganwild health potions after you've unlocked it in potions class. Just collect flubberworm mucus, But I don't hear any mucus! and Wigan tree bark, and walk up to a cauldron. You can drink the potions using the space bar, or you can set the game to have you automatically drink a potion when your health gets low. And while we're on the topic of health, the chocolate frogs in this game suck. In the first game, the chocolate frogs would remain stationary so you could collect them. But in this one, they're constantly hopping all over the dang place, and sometimes they'll jump off of ledges, making them impossible to get. It's just nitpicking, but I wish they were easier to catch. Quidditch is a lot more fun now as well. Even though it's pretty easy, you can actually lose this time, and it's completely optional. If you don't want to do Quidditch, then don't. Some matches will be locked until a certain point, but you can do the Quidditch matches whenever you feel like it, and you aren't pointlessly forced into playing it. And the final match against Slytherin to win the Quidditch Cup is intense. There's no messing around. You can also buy Quidditch armor and the Nimbus 2001 from Fred and George, who, despite supposedly setting up the bean trading system, are not stocked up very well. They will only be able to offer these two items to you throughout the entire game. How did these two ever run a business? Eventually, you'll get to go to your first class, Defense Against the Dark Arts, and you'll notice that not only did Lockhart's voice actor own it, but also that the spell learning system is different. Instead of tracing a pattern, a wand moves around the symbol, and when it passes over an arrow, you have to press the corresponding arrow key. It's actually kind of hard when you're running it on a fast, compatible machine, but it's pretty easy on this glitchy virtual machine. Parallels Desktop does not like games for some reason, Hmm. Anyway, where was I? Oh right, classes. The spell challenges are different too. 
Now the spell challenges are timed, but they give you way too much time to have any chance of losing. You still collect challenge stars to earn house points, but this time the house points aren't completely useless. They still aren't used for winning the house cup, which is disappointing, but they are used instead in the weekly house point ceremonies. Each time you finish a spell challenge, you'll have to go to the house point ceremony, where, if you beat Slytherin, you get to go to the bean bonus room. What's the bean bonus room, you may ask? Sugar-coated heaven, that's what it is. You just collect as many beans as you can before the timer runs out. You start with all the spells from the first game, except for Incendio. The new spells are Rictisempra, which is a stronger attack spell, Scourge, which can be used to get rid of ectoplasm and attack Peeves for some reason. Oh yeah, the Peeves boss battles are gone. Thank goodness. Peeves sucked. Oh baby, a triple! Then there's Defendo, which is the replacement for Incendio because they finally realized that Incendio is the fire conjuring charm. And finally, Spongify, which can make special carpets bouncy. Yeah, it sounds situational, like it would only be used like three times. But it's actually utilized surprisingly well for how completely and utterly stupid it sounds. By the way, Spongify reminds me of Spotify's name and logo now that I think about it. That's a copyright infringement. You know what they say, ignorant of the lol is not an excuse. And since I mentioned boss battles, there are a lot less of them in this game. You have one encounter with Peeves in the Rick December spell challenge, a boss near the end of the game, the final boss, and dueling. Oh yeah, dueling. Once you've done it the first time, you can duel anytime you want. You and your opponent put a certain number of beans into the jar, and whoever wins gets all the beans. You can use three spells during dueling. Rick Decempra, which decreases your opponent's stamina. Mimble Wimble, which keeps your opponent from correctly pronouncing the next spell's name. Weird. And Expelliarmus, which is supposed to be a disarming spell, but instead acts as a glorified tennis racket. The only spell that you really need is Rick Decempra. In dueling, I think I only use Expelliarmus and Mimble Wimble a handful of times, so just slowly work at your opponents with Rick Decempra, and don't bother with any of the other spells. Oh, and Stealth sort of makes a return, but not really. At one point, Harry uses the Polyjuice Potion to disguise himself as Goyle and ask Malfoy about the heir of Slytherin, but immediately after you finish talking to him, you turn back into Harry. Harry implies that you should sneak out without letting the Slytherin kids see you, but they are more observant than the genetically engineered soldiers from Metal Gear Solid. So it's impossible to do it that way. So, here's how you do it. Run. That's it. If you just keep running without stopping at all, you can get out of the Slytherin common room easily. And that is the only stealth section in the game. And Snape's Potion Storage Dungeon makes a return as, once again, the most boring level in the game. And it turns out that the ingredient was right behind a door to the potions classroom. Just another instance of Snape's inability to properly utilize space. Another problem I have with this game is that it's pretty short. I completed the game in seven hours. Approximately. I actually lost the ending footage. Stupid Apple. This is all your fault. It's definitely not as short as the first game, but it could have been longer. The game's story is also not too accurate to the original story. For instance, the beginning of the book and movie, Ron and Harry make it to the train station but can't get on because a character blocks the entrance to try and protect them. In the game, Ron and Harry just conveniently miss the train, which makes no sense unless Ron's parents are jerks and didn't tell Ron and Harry that they were leaving. Of course, I don't blame you, Harry, dear. Also, in the movie and book, Harry and Ron take the Polyjuice Potion, but in the game, only Harry does. I think it was done because of the limitations of the game engine used, but this is just another example of Harry doing all the work instead of Ron and Hermione. Also, the game has no level select, so if you missed a wizard card and you want to complete the game, you're screwed. There's no way to go back and get it. But despite all of this, I'd say that Chamber of Secrets for the PC is definitely worth checking out. It's not perfect, but still good. And I took away a great message from this game. There's a banquet waiting for you downstairs. What do you propose for the first toast? To friendship, loyalty, and courage, but to friendship most of all.